is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. A false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth and the life. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God. A false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus is the King of kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. Hallelujah. Let Lord Jesus Christ shine forth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us. Welcome to another live stream with DCCI Ministries. And tonight everyone is so happy because finally my guests are like very soon leaving. <laughs> You're happy, Hattie. <laughs> You're the happiest. Finally, you only a couple you. of more days. You Tomorrow doesn't count. She gonna cry when we leave. <laughs> you can see that on her face already. Uh, <laughs> she gonna cry when we leave. That's all right. So we've got kitchen crew here. Um, we will just get high from them in a bit. But tonight, what we will be doing is we will be going through um, Nasir Shadi's video on perfect Quran with the perfect holes in it. 
and then we will be talking through that. Um, so I hope you are here for that. Um, as we do that, so now topic is all open up in the open, Quran and pre pre preservation of the Quran and manuscripts, all that part and different Arabic Qurans. So I just gently encourage you to keep your conversations around that topic. As well as uh, please in the chat, do not share anyone's personal information. Uh, just not helpful, not helpful, even though your intention might be good. You never know who his hand might touch those informations. Do not abuse and harass the chat. That means do not copy and paste the same message again and again and again. It is not helpful to anyone. You will be probably timed out uh, when that happens, and we don't want that to be happen. Um, since finally, by God's grace, my guests are finally leaving don't very soon. Don't get too happy. Uh, At least try to not, not look so happy at it. Yeah, that's we kind of thought we kind of have goodbye songs for them. Um, so they will be leaving very soon. Um, before they leave, we just thought we do have the last live stream together. Um, sister, change your face and then I'm bring. Focused. Yeah, uh, that's my focus face. <laughs> okay, you need to work on your focus face. <laughs> As you work on your focus face, can you help us to do the sound check and tell us, um, beside like, tell us highlights of your time here, sister. Um, highlights of my time. If here. there is any, if there is not, not please make one up. <laughs> um, actually, highlights of my time is uh, having the the fellowship uh, with you and others, uh, daughter, um, brother K. And um, it just literally, um, just the welcome, welcoming um, hosp hospitality. And that was all from daughter and brother Kay. Can't speak for anyone else here. <laughs> Sister. I'm <laughs> just joking. Um, um, absolutely wonderful hostess. Um, very kind. Um, so I greatly appreciate it. And um, truly blessed by it. Who knows, you might get a roommate in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no roommate sister um, and I think it was good achievement because she lost approximately 8 kilograms or something I, I, fed, I, fed, I fed them I fed them once every other once every other day once a day and they lost weight so please send me the flowers and baklavas on your way out um so can I just confirm, can we just confirm the sound of Sister K was okay? Um, Brother K. Uh, what happened to my L? Uh, let's forget that for tonight because you are leaving very soon. I've, Party is like, I'm already in the like. I can't believe you already forgot the L in my name and I've, I've, I'm I haven't gonna, even left yet. I'm planning to block all of you once you leave. <laughs> oh, from <laughs> Skype, from Signal, from phone, from email. But um, for us to do sound check, can you just give us a couple of highlights, if there were any, um, your time here, and then we get the sound um, sound check from your, for you. Uh, I just praise the triune God for um, the work that He's done really in our lives here, in the lives of everyone in the kitchen crew and our wonderful sister Hatun, um, and really uh, the fellowship here. Uh, with this group, like I said yesterday, I pray that all of you, uh, all the Christians in the chat who are seeking uh, such in-person, authentic, um, really Christ-filled, Holy Spirit-filled fellowship that seeks, or oh, that focuses on God, I really hope you experience, I pray that you experience that very shortly. And if that doesn't happen shortly, I pray for patience and steadfastness in that. Um, that is what God intends for his people. So please uh, don't give up, don't compromise. And um, really, I, I think as long as we focus on Jesus, uh, focus on the gospel, focus on holiness, um, you know, it is, it is uh, well, fellowship with his people is, is really just an amazing, wonderful thing. Okay, I'm guessing sound for your side is okay, brother. Thank you very much for that. Uh, beloved thought of Christ, sound check, tell me. Since you are, everyone is leaving, can you please just tell me what kind of party you are going to have? 
Sister, I'm have a party because the kitchen crew will go back. Uh, yeah, home. you have party by but, yourself. But I'll I'll always be here with you, sister. You can't get rid of me. So uh, really I have nothing cute. to celebrate, guys. I'm I'm always gonna be with, with <laughs> sister Atun. Uh, I just want to thank you, sister, for having me uh, all these days. I was meant to, well, I wanted to look after you, but you looked after me. And um, okay, I'm guessing you, I'm guessing your sound is all right as well. So as you noticed, there is only one highlight overall. That is from Sister K, who lost eight kilogram thanks to feeding her <laughs> once every other day. <laughs> it was once a day, but we changed that to once every other day. <laughs> is she single? Sorry, no personal. That's very, very That's inappropriate fair. question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but all, all we do know that once she goes back, what are you going to eat, sister? Go back to eating my salads. Thank you very much. Okay, let's focus. Let's focus. <laughs> um, so, Brother Kiel, um, would you like to share anything you've done today with us um, in the sense of help us to kind of be encouraged a little bit? I did some street preaching. Well, I, I just helped uh, with street preaching today. And um, it was amazing to see faithful brothers in Christ come together and uh, really um, just take the opportunity to be obedient to God's word and share that with the loss um, in the UK. And it was it was quite heartbreaking to see um, the, the, really the defensive mechanisms that people had how people would avert their eyes or would they would like flash uh, a face of anger or even sometimes you just say hi miss how are you doing and uh, one sister she she broke down and she started crying as she just kept walking and so i pray um you know these these folks you know they they need jesus jesus is the only answer and so i pray uh that uh these brothers are, are faithful continue to be faithful and i pray that christians all over the uk uh pray about about uh, joining similar ministries and going out and proclaiming uh, Jesus and the gospel because absolutely, you know, there's no, uh, there's no denying it. Like Jesus is the only answer for this broken world. Thank you very much for reminding that. There is no any other way. There is only one way and that's Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, while that is kind of on the topic, I think that will be good, part, um, good time to, go to our main topic, which is holes in the narrative. Amen. Quran has been perfectly preserved. While it has been perfectly preserved, it has been also perfectly reproduced in different names, in different forms and shapes. So what we will do is we will listen clip from Shadi Nasir, where he's kind of going through the preservation of the Quran and then stop and then just make a comment. So we make sure that we all understood what is happening with the perfect many Qurans. So attention, um, need, need, a couple of things needs our attention as we watch the video. Uh, give attention how early Muslims disagreed regarding what's supposed to be in the Quran and how Quran's supposed to be. Give extra attention how many times and in what ways Muslims picked up which Qurans should be their Qurans. And then also think through the different versions of the Quran which he's going to be mentioning in the uh, video. Those are kind of just focus on as you listen. I think video is just a um, short. short video. I can't remember how long it is, but it is short video. So um, hopefully we will finish soon. If we don't finish it, we will pick it up where we left. Um, so if you want to get our attention in the chat, please put at sign in front of um, the CCI ministries. And we will take your comments on the topic or your questions. Our Skype is not on tonight, therefore, don't call. What is? Why are you laughing, sister? Just the cadence of don't call was sufficient. Okay. Bless yeah. your heart. Let, let, <laughs> let's 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 start. So um, we will listen to the video and then stop me if any any moment you wanted to pause and then we can talk about it. Let's get on with it. You have a corpus of things and you choose. And more or less, uh, that's the process of 
uh, the transmission of the Quranic text that we had a corpus of what we call different readings and different systems of readings and over time over the past let's say 1400 years really since the inception of the Quranic text uh, the Quranic text passed through many stages of canonizations uh, some of them were subtle uh, some of them were very obvious and um, recorded and written down in the historical documents and the word canonization here it's roughly equivalent to what we call standardization but it's really about picking and choosing we try to understand why certain readings or systems were picked up and other systems were removed that being said most muslims today they are used to roughly or more or less one specific reading which is uh, dominant since the 60s or since the basically the mid of the 20th century ibn mujahid i will talk about him now he is the first person to come up with a system of seven readings and this was in the uh, ninth century okay so he died 324 and al-azhar you all know we all know the institution of al-azhar in egypt and they were mainly responsible for coming uh, up in the uh, 1926 or 27 with the first printed edition of the Quran. And they picked one system, one reading out of the seven or the 10 different systems and they voweled the Quran uh, according to that system. And this is why in the Arab world and the Muslim world, mostly we are familiar with this reading due to the efforts of Al-Azhar in spreading and circulating this specific uh, reading and recitation. What are these? So let's pause here for a second. So basic argument used to be, sometimes without any shame still is, there is only one Quran which has been perfectly preserved, dot by dot, letter by letter, sound by sound, word by word. But um, Shadir Nasir, Nasir is simply telling us actually, no, they picked and choose, they picked and removed certain Qurans, and in 1920s, they picked only one Quran out of many Qurans. There were many Qurans, still there are today many Qurans, but in 1920, 1920s, 1920s, uh, 1920s, they picked only one Quran, which is mainly known as the Hafs Quran, because that was, um, Ottomans were conquering the certain lands and they were they were using the halves in Al Azhar they decided they will go with the halves Quran. So Quran Muslims are reading today is identified, majority of Muslims are reading today is identified as the halves Quran. Name of their Quran is halves. You go to different parts of the world, you will see Bosch Quran, Kalun's Quran and then this goes on and on and on. Um, anyone wants to make any comment at this stage? Beloved? Uh, just, a, just a point. Uh, he mentioned Al Azhar in Egypt, uh, who picked one of those Qurans in 1926 to 27. Um, the reason it's so um, famous is because uh, Al, it, it was the, um, the resources of Al Azhar, which were big at the time, um, that circulated, printed uh, that, uh, that Quran, and that's why Muslims know about it. So it was actually the power and the, the funds that they had. It wasn't because one was better than the other. It was just one that they chose, that they happened to choose. So, And also helpful to remember, Egypt is not the headquarter of Islam. No, it isn't. And helpful to remember, scholars in Al-Hazar Uni never met with men called Muhammad, peace, police, and FBI be upon him. They never had a converse, conversation with Angel Gabriel, yet approximate 1,300 years after the death of Muhammad, they decided they will canonize the Quran. Someone who never met with Muhammad, someone who never had a conversation with Gabriel, someone who never met with the Sahabais, makes a decision which Quran is supposed to be read. And miracle is, it's not Saudi Arabia. And side note, helpful to remember also, in some part of the world, Hafs Quran is being banned. So if you go to Algeria, you cannot read the Hafs Quran in Algeria. Um, anyone wants to add anything at this stage, dear kitchen crew? Um, it seems fairly recent for it to be preserved for 1,400 years. I mean, 19... 26. 26. So it's young, older than you. Maybe. It is. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, it is. It is older than you, so that's like still old. <laughs> but my gra- my grandmother's older than that Quran. I know. Wow. Isn't that sad? Yeah, my grandmother too. So in her time, the Quran wasn't standardized when she was born. <sighs> I just wonder, he said uh, they chose one reading out of seven or ten. So, so they don't even know if it was a one out of seven or one out of ten. That, that looks like a, a hole to me. Yeah. The narrative. And also remember, as they say reading, actually they mean like different Arabic Qurans. Quran of Havs, Quran of Wash. So that's a side note. And when it, it says seven reading, actually they are talking about 14 Qurans. When it says 10, they are talking about 20 Qurans plus that 10 main readers, so 30 Qurans. It's like all very much complicated, but essentials what we get, there were lots of different Arabic Qurans were circulating, and today's Quran is younger than thought of Christ's grandma. Mm. It's just amazing. I wonder what, she, what Quran she read before they st- standardized it and start selling it, uh, circulating it. Uh, sister, we got two uh, ex-Muslim believers in Christ yep. in the in the chat. We got one from India and one from Bosnia. Just wanted to say hello and God bless you guys. Welcome to the family. Um, let's continue. Different variants in the Quran, and uh, are they textual? Are they phonetic? Uh, are they due to dialect? Do they affect the meaning of the verses? Um, do they not affect the meaning? Uh, what, what kind of um, omissions, additions we have? Are they similar to you know, other variants we have in other uh, scriptures? 632, okay, 11 Hijri, 632, uh, the prophet dies. One of the questions that we ask ourselves, why didn't and the prophet did not die suddenly? He knew when he was dying, he predicted it, you know, he performed the last pilgrimage, and he did not collect the text, okay? He didn't. We have some accounts, they are weak really accounts, weak in terms of, uh, from even the Islamic tradition, that he probably had a prototype of the Quran. He told some people to write down some verses, to you know, change the order, but we really don't any have solid accounts of the Prophet collecting the Quran and coming up with a text. Okay? Even if he did, of course, we don't have this collection. So the Prophet dies and the text was not collected together. Then, So let's pause here. We all kind of I think as a basic, we do know Muhammad was very busy. Peace is police and FBI be upon him. He was, he was very busy with, from his wives. He was very busy from overlasting over children. He was very busy sucking the uh, tongue of boys. He was very busy by selling and buying people and all those kind of things. He was very busy, but he knew his days are coming to end because he knew he's fulfilling the prophecy. When he makes a lie about us, we will cut his aorta. That time was coming. It took three years of suffering. And in that three years of suffering, Mr. Mohammed, peace is police and FBI be upon him, did not collect the Quran. Why is that? Sister, he had one, he had one, <coughs> job, he had one job to do. You mean like after having sex with kids, with wives, selling the boys, selling people after that? Or he became, main a, pro- job? He became a prophet age 40. He died age 63. In the 23 years he was a prophet, he had one job. To give the word of Allah to the people. From Jibreel, from Allah to Jibreel, to Muhammad, to the people. So in those 23 years he couldn't collect. And the Quran is a small book. It's smaller than the New Testament. He couldn't collect those verses and, and, and before he died? Why? It's not only like he didn't do it in 23 years, but he knew he's getting ready to die. So you would like kind of take it seriously. I would take that as a failure. He failed his mission. Very bad he? leader skills, leadership skills. Very bad, very bad. And like, didn't he have a, a personal scribe? Yeah. And if his scribe didn't write down the Quran, then what did his... What, was the purpose of his scribe. What were they doing in the desert? They had no job. All they did was raid caravans and then take the spoils. 
That's busy work, sister. It's not. You just have to raid a caravan maybe once a year. But the rest of the time, they just hung around the desert. No, the rest have... of the time, you've got to deal with these captives who you got it. So you need to have sex with them in front of their husbands. Yeah. It's a busy job. Yeah, slaughtering people, is, it, it makes your arms tired. So uh -huh. it's harder to write. You know, those are fine motor skills. And swiping with a blade is... It's hard. Yes. Yeah, so what we got from this part is, I think... Life of Muhammad just breaks our heart. Bless his heart. He couldn't even put he couldn't even put one and only Quran together. He knew he's gonna die. Bad leadership skills, bad profit skills. Messed up, messed up. Didn't so sound like he cared. If he cared about the word of Allah, he knew he was dying. He should have panicked and started the process, but he didn't. Or just tell Aisha, like he died in the laps of Aisha. She he could simply tell Aisha, Aisha. I'm getting ready to die. Please make sure that this, don't put the Quran under your pillow. Sheep <laughs> will come and eat it. Like he couldn't even say that. It's just like heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking. Um, shall we continue? Yes, yes. Third Caliph Uthman, and this is what we call the major collection of the Quran, happened during his time, okay? And this is the year 47 Hijri, Islamic calendar around 656. So this is roughly 30 something years after the Prophet dies, okay? So now according to the major narrative, the Quran was collected, you know, around 35 years after the Prophet died. Um, and this is what we call the first collection. So, so this is not canonization. Um, this is still a collection of the Quran. The Quran was uh, spread, it was written on, on different forms, on different parchments, on bones, on leaves. So I'm just posing that in intention there is someone who is expressing he's from Algeria and then you, we've got Hafs and Vosh Quran. I don't want to be the heart crushing, especially my guests are leaving, I'm like getting ready for party. But according to newspapers, in Algeria, Hafs Quran is being banned. Please watch our previous live streams. You can even get access to the sources. So don't come to the live stream and lie. It is banned to be read in the mosques. Um, so let's just continue with this one. This is the year 47 Hijri, Islamic calendar around 656. So this is roughly 30 something years after the Prophet dies. Okay? So now according to the major narrative, the Quran was collected you know, around 35 years after the Prophet died. Um, and this is what we call the first collection. So, so this is not canonization. Um, this is still a collection of the Quran. The Quran was uh, spread, it was written on, on different forms, on different parchments, on bones, on leaves. Uh, Uthman collects them, not himself, a committee did that. And this is what we call today the Uthmanic uh, Codex. There were other codices by other companions that we don't have access to. They were destroyed, they were burned. And the only survived, the codex which survived is the uh, Codex of Uthman. And the first 200 years, this is what we usually call like the formative period of Islam. We really don't know much about it from that period. We only have writings from later period, from later historical sources about what was happening. We don't have really writings from the first century and basically mid of the second century, uh, Islamic calendar. And during that period, we do know that there were many reciters and many scholars reading and reciting the Quran in so many different ways, okay? Not even according to seven systems or ten systems. They were reciting the Quran in, according to one compilation to 50 different systems and readings, okay? And this is, was, of course, too much. So you need, you are, you are establishing, you know, this is the new religion, you are establishing a new government, you need to stand, you need a constitution. And you can't just like have 50 different versions of one divine text. You need to limit these variants. So this man came, Ibn Mujahid, which is in the title, and he compiled a book uh, which is called The Seven Readings, as Sabah fil Qiraat. And he said, well, out of those 50 plus different systems of recitations, I'm going to limit myself to only seven, where he uh, neglected the 43 different systems and he chose seven systems because of different criteria that we are still trying to figure out. But what helped him is that he was politically connected. So he actually was connected with the court and he forced people who did not follow his system 
to actually go to prison. So there were other reciters and other scholars who disagreed with him. And they said, no, why are you limiting yourself to those seven? And he said, well, this is my opinion. You have to follow me. He was connected with the wazir, Ibn Muqla, by the time. And then the wazir, anyone who disagreed with Ibn Mujahid's systems, they tried them, they put them in prison, and they would either repent or they would follow Ibn Mujahid's system. And it became basically a standard since then that people would follow the system of the seven, what we call right now. After so let's pause, let's pause here. So we are listening Shadir Nasir, Shadi Nasir, or as he talks about the preservation of the Qurans. Um, who wants to go first and make a comment? Um, he said it was based on his opinion, not research, not scholarly research, not the accuracy of their holy texts, quote unquote. Um, it was just solely based upon one person's opinion. It wasn't Muhammad's opinion. It was some other guy's opinion. I don't know if he got choked by Jibril in a cave too. No, he but, didn't. Okay, he didn't. Oh. Like be, be confident he didn't. Okay, I'm pretty sure he wasn't. <laughs> Brother, do you want to make a comment? Um, so I was very surprised by his comment about, uh, he said that the first 200 years um, after the Prophet's death were the formative years of of the Quran and uh, formative years that reminds me of, of uh, it's, a, it's something for uh, for one of the stages of childhood so the formative years of childhood are between zero and eight years so uh, years of a child's life where they learn more quickly than at other at any other time in life so it, it really stuns me to think that you know Allah's perfect word grew up and formed over 200 years. That's not what I've been told. Uh, thank you for that. Um, sister, beloved? Um, it wasn't what I was told either, sister. Shadi Nasser said, quote, there were 50 different systems and readings, and because you had a government and a new religion, it's too much. You can't have 50 different versions of one divine book. Uh, what I was told was the book, there was only one book, one Quran, from Muhammad to Jibreel, through, everybody knew what it was from beginning to end. But I didn't know there were 50 different versions. And he said that Ibn Mujahid neglected 43 upon criteria that were still, they're still trying to figure out what criteria. So he could have just randomly was like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, just choose what, he, we didn't know what criteria. And um, like Sister said, there was no... Uh, you know, a meeting with the scholars to check which one and go rigorously through them. He was just like, I'm connected. This, this is my opinion. If you don't like it, I'll put you in prison. It sounds very much like Islam, sister, from its beginning to now. Yeah. 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 200 years, no history of Islam. We don't know what happened within that two years. All we are getting information which are written much later, as Brother K said, Kial said, Oh yeah, like baby, baby's already grown up. <laughs> yeah. They missed the opportunity over there, 200 years. And uh, Ibn Mujahid is the one who put together the, the seven reading. Sister, remind me again, how did he do? We don't know. Uh, he just chose them. And he, Shadi Nasser said he neglected, neglected 43 and chose the seven upon criteria that we're still trying to figure out what they are, to so now. Today, we still don't know yeah. why this man, Ibn Mujahid, at the first place, chose seven different Qurans. We don't know. I find that's amazing. And the moment you disagree with him, what happens? You don't get baklava or hot chocolate or cheesecake. You get prison. Why? Because politics steps in. Mm -hmm. Politics steps in, and with that one... And who is Ibn Mujahid? Where is his authority come from? He's just um, a random person 300 years after Muhammad came. Okay, let's, let's be kind in that, sister. Let's break it down. Are you trying to tell me Ibn Mujahid did not meet with Muhammad? It was 300 years later. So <laughs> it wasn't even, from, meet... wasn't even from where Muhammad was born or anything. It was miles away. Did he meet with Angel Gabriel? No. No? And he didn't meet with any of Muhammad's companions, all the successors, all um, a few generations away. All he did was be connected to the state. Connections are important. That's it. <laughs> Connections are important. 
Yeah. But not your connection to Muhammad or the Sahaba is, but your connection to the Wazir. Um, how do you say Wazir? Wazir is Council, like, a, like is gov a ruler, governor, yeah. Ibn Mukhla, his name. Yeah. Yeah. So, you can simply pick, you've got 50 different Qurans, you are going to pick only seven of them. Let's go with this seven. Why? We don't need to tell anyone. In 21st century, hopefully people will figure out, but it is 21st century. And people have not figured it out yet. They are still trying to, scholars are still trying to figure out why that seven versus not other seven. And why seven? Why not eight or nine? Why not or one? Or three? Why not or one? Why don't you just pick one? Yeah. Yeah, because it is only one recitation is going to intercede for you on the Day of Judgment. Uthman put only one. What happened to that one from 656? to 935, 300 years. How come one Quran produced 50 different Arabic Qurans? And man out of the blue or the pink steps in, and then he picks seven, not even one, out of this 50 without any connection to the Prophet, so-called Muhammad. I find this just like more holes in the narrative. Being popular doesn't make it right. It is only one recitation is going to intercede for you on the Day of Judgment. Not the popular one. But which one? Yeah, Allah knows nothing knows best. One of them. And also helpful, helpful for us to remember, there was only one version of the Quran, which was, according to Muslims, Uthman compiled. Yet when he posted around, there were a couple of different versions of it. But how this one Quran become 50 different Arabic Qurans? How? That's what we call miracle of Islam. Anyone wants to add anything? No? No. Continue. Let's continue. Ibn died in 324, scholars still disagreed with him. So also 500 years later, this man comes, Ibn al-Jazri, and say, well, I'm not content with seven systems. I'm going to basically compile ten systems. And this is what we, are, what we call the system of the ten readings. Seven of those systems are the same systems of Ibn Mujahid, but he added three more. We have this very important period. And this is Let, let's just, uh, as I am a woman, sometimes I do struggle to understand very basics. So this guy called Ibn Mujahid, out of blue or out of pink, decides he's going to go with seven Qurans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then 300 years after him, Ibn Mujahid comes, so, sorry, 500, around 1,400. Ibn Jazari comes and then says, uh-oh, I don't know the reason of seven. I've got three more so I want to add in this one. Let me add that. It's always good to have extras. So he puts three extra in here. Hmm. Why? And which three? Uh, we, we do not each other. No, I mean, uh, wh wh which what was three, his criteria? Which three did he choose and why, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. Hmm. Comments? Um, Speechless? I, I am because you, you well, I'm going to try this talk. But um, because you hear this narrative that it's one Quran perfectly preserved over a 14, 1300 year period, and they don't even have it together within the first 100 years. And so you have them hundreds of years later just adding books and adding narrative, narratives that they so choose, not because of its, um, its accuracy, but they just want it. Yeah, and if you don't, if you do not agree with me, go to prison. Yeah, I put you in prison until you agree with me. Oh, okay. That's the criteria. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the criteria. Awesome. I think it's just double awesome. I'm very surprised. I mean, I don't. What, yeah, what's the point of adding three more recitations? Is it like, you know, progressive Christianity where you're trying to get more people to, more people into the religion? So that, uh, like, I don't understand why they would expand the collection. 
other than yeah to get more I guess to increase the number uh, in the community. It doesn't make that much sense that like why there is, there are seven. He says, oh, we've got seven. Let's add three more. <laughs> now ten sound is easy to say. Yeah, it's a nice even number. Yeah. It's divisible by five, divisible by two. My question is, why are they increasing? They should be reducing. Aim is supposed to be going back to the one Quran, but for that, and they had to wait until 1926 to put that together. Oh. Hmm. Uh, Uncle, we got an answer. It says, because 7 plus 3 is 10. I think that's a good answer. Yes. Good yes. maths. I'm sorry that... Allah and Muhammad couldn't put that together because in their mind it's supposed to be one. Maybe when they think, oh, when zero comes after the number, that makes that number unvaluable. But actually, when it, it is like before comes the number. So that is like a little bit mathematic lux over there, but we let that go. That's what happened. Let's continue. North Africa, Muslim Spain, right? And this is a Dami and a Shatabi, they were both from uh, Andalusia. So a Shatabi, he wrote a very famous poem and he summarized all the different variants of those seven readings in the poem. And uh, a Dami, what he did is that he, um, a Shatabi, he wrote the poem based on a manual that a Dami wrote. So a Dami mm -hmm. simplified the book of Ibn Mujahid. A Shatabi came and put it in, you know, he versified this manual. You would think that, oh, okay, fine, we have one system and it's one reading, but actually it is not. Each of those seven eponymous readers, they had different disciples, okay? And each disciple actually was reciting something different from his other classmate. So you'd have, let's say, a professor who is the eponymous reader, and he had like, you know, 15 students. And then the 15 students will go and say different things. But then those 15, they really didn't agree on everything. So they would have, let's say, a 20% you know, uh, differences in what they are saying. So what Danny and Ashatabi did is that, okay, we are not going to take what those 15 students narrated from the eponymous readers. I'm just going to take two, okay? So two out of 15 or 20. And this is what we call the canonical uh, rawis, the transmitters uh, developed during that period. Again, and it survived until today. Well, this is what we call Hafs an Asim. So Hafs is a transmitter. And Asim is the eponymous reader. So if you want to do the Quran, you don't do Asim. There is no such thing as Asim. There is Hafs an Asim. So Hafs on the authority of Asim. We have the Medina tradition, for example, Warsh. Okay, say Warsh an Nafa. Nafa is the eponymous, the boss, right? And Warsh is the disciple. So there is no such thing as the reading of Nafa. There is a transmitter on behalf of his master. But we do have different transmitters, but those traditions died out, and only those two transmitters survived. And this is because of, you know, these two men right here. Uh, I call it... Okay, let, let's, let's just understand that. Quran is supposed to be preserved by oral tradition. So far, it is very much messed up in oral tradition and in written tradition. So you've got one teacher has 50 different students and his students who are, whose job to recite the Quran learn the Quran, recite it, put it together, are disagreeing approximately 20% of the Quran what they learned from their teacher. And then Mr. X comes and then says, we can't deal with this 20, with, with this 50 different students. Let's make life much easier. We go only with two of them. And seven readings actually, four, seven Qurans actually, 14 different Qurans. My question is, sister, if there's one teacher, boss, like he says, eponymous reader, and he has 15 students, they should all be learning the same thing. Why are they disagreeing? They have the same master. Oh, well, not every teacher is John Lennox. But he's you sit in, in his every... class, you, everyone learns the same thing. In here, you sit in the class, everyone learns different th things from one teacher, and they disagree with one another. Teachers teacher is bad teacher and those people were told to handle the word of Allah students are not handling it well not very good education system over there there's no handling it's just the word of Allah they write it and recite it there's no handling of anything why is there 20% difference in between them 
It's only 20%, sister. Be 20% generous. 20% is a, is a, a fifth. So 6,236 divided 20, approximately 300 verses. That's just within one reader. Yeah. And there are lots of other readers. There are 50 students. They are disagreeing 300, 300 verses of the Quran. That's just for one reader and between each other. And then you have another reader, it's the same problem. And another reader, another reader. Yeah, so, seven, so you've got seven teachers and then... They had like, one of them, let's say, had 50 different students, and one of them has like 63 students. They are all different from one another. And then people make a decision regarding which one we are going to pick up. What do they say? They don't say, oh, let's pick up to who is the best in the class, or who kind of took the exams and then got like 99% of all. They're just like, yeah, I like this guy. He so sounds like, looks nice. Yeah, how did they decide which two? Just a bit random. And why two? Why didn't they just take one? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, this is these are very excellent questions from daughter here. And I would, yeah, I, I wonder what was Allah thinking? He wasn't thinking. That was the issue. <laughs> he wasn't thinking. Is that yeah. because he's a lifeless idol? Is that why he wasn't thinking? If he taught, he would kind of train Muhammad to learn and do something about it. Right, if he think about it, at the beginning, he would just reveal only one Quran. He wouldn't abrogate the Quran and wouldn't even allow sheep to come and eat the Quran. He wasn't thinking at all. Yeah. So he just allowed all these humans to mess about? With his, what, with his word like that? Just pick and choose? Yeah, that's the question because Allah promises that he is going to preserve the Quran. Surah 15 verse 9. But human being steps in and then they decide to preserve many different Qurans. Messed up students, messed up teachers, and then we end up with messy holes in the narrative. So Yasir Qadi was right? Yeah, we always give him credit. <laughs> He was right. Any other comments? No? It's like, at this stage, I'm assuming we are all kind of got the idea. Written tradition is failed. Oral tradition is failed too. Mm -hmm. yes. Perfectly preserved, not perfectly preserved at all. Or he could have picked a better prophet. That could actually read. That would have helped. That would have helped a little bit. Yeah, but he wasn't thinking. That is true. Or he could have put his scribes to work. I mean, that's the point of a scribe is to write down things. He could be doing lots of things, brother. But instead of getting thirteen wives and having all these battles, he should have just sat down. If he did, couldn't learn to read, he just learned to read, yeah. and then write the Quran himself and just give it to us. It's so simple. He had this twenty years. It takes only a couple of years to learn how to read and write, oh, especially if you can scribe, speak, like you said, especially yeah. if you can speak. And remember, one of the first thing Allah created is what? The pen. Pen. Allah created pen. That's already screams out. Being able to read and write is something important. Maybe it was a decorative pen because there are decorative pens that are not meant to be used to write. No, you just put it on your shelf. Not for so this Maybe one. it was on the throne. Maybe he just put it on his throne just for decorative. Not for this one. Oh, are you sure he the used other? the pen to write the Quran. Yeah, he did. Okay. Not for this one. So you know how he used the pen to write the Quran? You should have just thrown it down to Muhammad. Yeah, and then Muhammad, let me teach you how to read and write. Or give it to people who can read. Christian God stepped in and then he messed with his hands. He involved his hands and created man and woman. Versus Allah couldn't even bother to just come down and then teach Muhammad how to read and write so that he can put together the Quran. But he does. The first verse he says to him is read. And he ignores it. Yeah, Muhammad says, like, excuse me, um, don't you know? I don't know how to read. Let me make it up. He says it three times. Not helpful, not helpful. Oral tradition messed up. Written tradition messed up. Many different Arabic Qurans, politics steps in and then says, those who disagree with me will end up in prison. We will pick two students out of 50 
to put the Quran together. And that takes place at very early stage of Islam. Let's continue. A fourth canonization because uh, what Al Azhar did in 1923 and followed also by the first audio recording in 1964 of Al Husari of the Quran. The first audio recording was based on that specific reading, which we are all familiar with now, is Hafs an Asim, right? And what Al Azhar did in 1923, they printed the Quran and they voweled it based on that specific reading. And since that time, most Muslims and most Arabists, and you know, this is how, this, when you grow up in a Muslim country, you read the Quran based on that, unless you are in a very specific, you know, regions. But most people are familiar with that specific uh, tradition, which is Hafsa and Asim, which is different. I don't want to say very different from the other traditions, but it is different. Due to that first printed edition, which became available to everyone, everyone would buy the Quran and would have access to it, and it's based on the reading of Hafsa and Asim, that specific reading out of seven systems and if actually if you want to also divide it into seven two from each one that's you have potentially 14 different systems but if you just go to a bookshop and you buy you get a Quran you will most probably get just that edition which we are all familiar with the the idea is that the Prophet uh, received the revelation okay from um, not directly from God, right, through basically Gabriel, right? And then the Prophet recited it to the Muslim community, to his, di to his disciples, right, to the companions. Basically, allegedly, the idea is that all of them received more or less the same transmission. And the Muslim community, which are the, dis the disciples of the Prophet back then, they also transmitted that Quran orally. We are talking about oral transmission here. There's no written transmission. So this is all memory. You memorize it, you, you, you recite it to the others, and people, uh, there was no ri writing system was very minimal back then. Um, the companions of the Prophet also transmitted it and recited it to their disciples, which we call the successors, okay, or tabi'un. And this, the same process happened, you know, over and over and over. And this is what in Islamic tradition we call tawatur. And tawatur means that the Quran was transmitted in such a way that it is impossible for divergences or differences to happen within the text. This, it's like something that is known for everyone. When you say, for example, you know, the sky is blue, this is something what we call in Arabic mutawatir. Everyone knows the sky is blue. You know, the Quran was transmitted to the whole community and it's known to everyone that there's no such way. People cannot just, you know, collude on error. And we're not now talking from our perspective, even from the perspective of medieval Muslim scholars. When they looked at the different codices of the Quran and what we call the different variants, they said, okay, well, wait a minute. So why do we have these variations in the text? Why do we have textual variations? Why did some of the companions of the Prophet uh, have different codices from the main codex, you know, of, the, of Uthman, okay, the third caliph? Um, why do we have dialectal variations? If the Quran is the word of God, does God or did God speak in dialects, for example? Okay, so did he go and recite to the Prophet one verse according to the dialect of the East, and then next day he recited to him the dialect from the West? So Muslim scholars they were trying to you know, understand like, these variations. What are the sources of these variations? Are they divine? Or people came up with these variations and they are all permitted or we have a license to read in these different variations. That being said, if we do have license to read in different forms, why some variations were accepted and other variations were rejected? Now, what are the implications of that? The important thing is... Let's just pause that. Let's just pause that. Lots of good questions Muslim scholars are asking. They are giving us lots of questions because they don't know the answers. All those different Qurans, is Allah speaking? Which dialect is Allah speaking? Is those dialects Allah intended at the first place? Are they divine or not? Allah, who knows nothing, knows best, cannot answer those very basic questions. Um, Anyone wants to make any comments so far, like knowledge of Allah, perfect Quran, different Qurans, messed up, divine, undivine? So he said it was written in a way that there could be no textual variance? Impossible for diversion. Okay. So how do you have multiple um, versions or yeah. of it if there, it was impossible to have any 
Like, like he, that's miracle. It's oh. called miracle of Islam. It is impossible for the version, yet we've got different Arabic words. Okay, and I, I think early on, um, when we came into this speech, he said 1923. Yep. Yes. Did he mispronounce the seventh century? No, he intentionally meant to say 1923. Oh, okay, because I was just seeing it was perfectly preserved since, you know, the time of the false prophet. In your dreams. I'm just asking questions. That's all. <laughs> There are lots of questions people are already asking, which doesn't have an answer. So okay. you are just adding more questions, sister. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's funny that what they told, tell us in the mosque and in Muslim schools is this pyramid. Someone called this a, a, a scam pyramid. Yep. So they told us this story, which he had on the screen, the pyramid. They didn't uh, tell us these questions, sister, and they, we, didn't, we didn't know about this um, as Muslims. Uh, all these different um, questions. I think in those few minutes, is, you know, Islam is destroyed. Very important questions. That even Muslim scholars that back at that time were asking these questions, and yet that kind of narrative has been hidden until now. Um, why do we now only hear this in the mainstream that these questions were an issue when they were that early on in Islam? That tells you Islam was a, was a scam from the beginning. And the narrative that they were saying about the mutawatir, you know, sky is blue, the whole Muslim community knew what the Qur'an was. It couldn't be something that, you know, people have variations on. But then you have variations, so it's, it's bad. Yes, and not only are there variations in a perfectly preserved Qur'an, but he's, he asked, you know, are these variations divine? You know, are these variations caused by Allah? Which... Yes, that, I'm not sure. If, is that is that logical? Does that make sense for a perfectly preserved Quran to have divine variations within it? It's what Yasser Qadi said, brother. Um, there are human elements in the Quran. That's what he said, and the, I think this these are the human elements. In that um, these variations came up in between those times, and we can't trace them back. We don't know where they came from. We don't know how they came. Uh, came to be there, it, given the narrative that everybody knew, the sky is blue, everybody knows what the Qur'an is. Um, and where does this license come? come? Who, who gives this license that we can, you know, read those different readings? And like you said, then which ones? What, if, that, if we have that license, how come some readings were rejected, neglected, even lost? So did some of Allah's variations get lost? What happened? Some of them were even put on the river. Remember? Oh, 1923. Yeah, the, Nile, the Nile River. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it's all good questions scholars asked about the Quran. That shows us Muslim scholars knew that there are many different versions of the Quran, has variations. They are different from one another, and Allah knows best, knows nothing, doesn't tell us which Quran is the correct one, or all those variations are divine or not. That's all good. It's good to discuss those things. You end up in 21st century. You end up in mosque, like daughter of Christ was. You hear there is only one perfect Quran, perfectly preserved, dot by dot, letter by letter, sound by sound. What scholars are saying versus what your imams, what your mom, what your Muslim missionaries are saying doesn't match. Your imams, your Muslim scholars, your mom and your father, they are lying to you. They know the truth, they are just hiding it from you. They knew about it, they discussed it, but when it comes to teaching, they know it is causing people to give up Islam. When it comes to teaching, what they do is Oh, forget all that what has been discussed in the past. We will go with the proper statement. There is only one Quran which has been perfectly preserved as Allah promised 15.9. Dot by dot, letter by letter, sound by sound, word by word. We tell this to our children. They will grow up with this one and then it will all stay with them. No one is going to talk about different Arabic Qurans. No one is going to read all those books which is written about different Arabic Qurans and variations. 
There are some Muslims saying we are lying. Yeah. So my uh, claim is that the Quran has been one and the same and has never been changed. Disgraceful. That's just like you, even your fingers are lying. Not only your <laughs> not, not only your mouth, but your fingers are lying. Seriously, yeah. like. Is Shadi Nasser lying as well? Was Yasser Qadi lying when he said holes in the night? Is the bookshelf is lying? Yeah, maybe there's a, a one-sided pyramid that he's talking about, like these pyramid shapes that we see here with all of these readings and variations. Is that not true? Or is that an accurate depiction of, of the variations through time? Because you've been lied, therefore you think it's still all right to lie. But I don't want to be heart crushing here, but you've been lied and don't lie to us. We are helping you to pull yourself together and learn a little bit truth. Your Muslim scholars are telling us there are holes in the narrative. Your Muslim scholars are telling us they cannot put together the, what is Ahrub, what is Qurat, Allah knows best, all that junk. And now a scholar is simply telling us, not any scholar, but a scholar from Harvard is telling us, yep, they were all different Qurans, we are trying to put together. We are asking those questions, but we don't have an answer. So much love towards mm -hmm. Quran. <clears throat> yeah. That's like, because you've been lied from early age, mm -hmm. you are playing the game of denial. On the Day of Judgment, when different Arabic Qurans are out there, and then the one you are reciting doesn't turn up to intercede for you, what are you going to say? No one told me that there were different. I didn't know which one I recited. You will be hunting for the eternal word of Yahweh, Lord Jesus Christ, who is interceding for you. But by that time, if you haven't repented, it's going to be too late that you will be listening, fight between different Arabic Qurans, and then see who is going to win. You know, there are a lot of studies that say, you know, small lies lead to bigger lies, lead to whoppers of lies. And if you look at, at these uh, diagram here, and instead of variations, you think of it as lies, that would be a very accurate, I believe, the depiction of, of how lies grow and grow and grow. And here we are today. And it's just very difficult. It's impossible, really, for uh, the protected people group to cover all of these lies at this point. Yeah, like, one of the essential is you don't trust oral tradition. One person lied, when it comes to Islam, of course. One person lies, and then everyone else is talking about it, and everyone thinks that's truth. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Yeah. One lie produces more liars. More liars produce more liars. 21st century, 7th August, 2102. Now we are in the age where your fingers are lying everybody lying and then when you come tell them the truth because you're different for what they hear and then you're the liar mm. sad continue. yeah let's continue a liturgical space so if you want to pray you have to pray and recite Muslim scholars they were trying to you know, understand like, these variations, what are the sources of these variations? Are they divine? Or people came up with these variations and they are all permitted or we have a license to read in these different variations. That being said, if we do have license to read in different forms, why some variations were accepted and other variations were rejected? Now, what are the implications of that? The important thing is a liturgical space. So if you want to pray, you have to pray and recite the Quran according to those seven different systems. You can't pray and recite something outside those seven systems. So that's basically the crux of the matter here. It's a liturgical text. It says, for example, when the first collection of the Quran took place, um, the man who was responsible for, who was the head of the committee, uh, again, I mean, put this in parallel with the idea that the Quran was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew all the information or all the Quran and it was mutawatir as we say.
But then in this account, and this account is the official narrative, this is from one of the um, canonical traditions of the, the Bukhari. Okay, so this is the uh, canonical um, account of the transmission of the Quran from the Muslim tradition. It says that um, there were two verses from the Quran that he did not find with anyone else, and they were only with one specific companion. Okay, um, he see the locating the parchments and poems from the uh, memories of man who knew it by heart. And then I found with Khuzayma, that's the name of the person, two verses of from Surah At-Tawbah which I had not found with anyone else. Okay, again we have to ask ourselves. So why these two men had two verses from the Quran that no one else from the companions of the Prophet had? Okay. So what happened to the idea that the Quran actually was transmitted to everyone and everyone knew the Quran by heart? If we were again talking here from the Islamic perspective, we are not even going out. So we compare this account with the other accounts from the Islamic tradition, we find contradictions. And what we try to understand is why do we have these contradictions? And which narrative is this narrative before the narrative that the Quran is transmitted, you know, to everyone equally or it's way the other way around or it's a vicious circle and we really can't know which one came before the other so first the okay let's pause here for a minute there are verses which end up in the Quran only one person's testimony there are verses end up in the Quran only one by one person's testimony if you are Quran only Muslim these two verses, Surah 9, verse 128 and 129, is not in your Quran. Why? Because these verses, according to the Islamic tradition, end up in your Quran only by one person's testimony. There's application of that to Muhammad as well, like who Muhammad is. If one, per one verse ends up in one person's testimony, then you seem to ask the basic question. How can we trust the rest? Why Muslims are screaming out that there are thousands of people who memorize the Quran? See, more lies and more lies. Not thousand people who memorize, thousands of people who memorize the Quran. A few, and they couldn't even do a good job at all. Um... Any comments? Uh, he said, sister, that you need a liturgical text to, so that you can pray. Uh, it's true, when Muslims pray, they need to recite the Quran, so it needs to be correct. They need to be reciting a divine text. But he said it has to be uh, according to one of the seven systems. But who came up with the seven systems? It wasn't Muhammad, it was Ibn Mujahid. So is, our, is their prophet Ibn Mujahid now, or what? So if Ibn Mujahid got it wrong, that means all Muslims are right now messed up in their prayer. Yeah. Prayer is their worship and they are messed up worshiping Allah. Why? Because man who never met Muhammad, man who never had a um, connection or communication with Gabriel, decides to pick a couple of different Qurans and then put people in prison. Sad, but your prayer life is messed up. And also for people in the chat who are saying, oh, the recitations, there's no much difference. Uh, Shari Nasser just said there are contradictions between them. And then he also expressed, even students said 20% of difference, what teachers said and what between other students. And if the differences weren't that much, why were people be put in prison, yeah. tried, tortured, and forced, if it wasn't that big a deal, if it was the same thing, but different recitations? There were big differences. And um, by the way, sister, the reference that we were, um, there were only two, the two verses were found by only one person. It wasn't with the Muslim community, the rest of the Muslim community. That comes from Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari 509, 510. Um, how many years after Muhammad? 250 Bukhari? years after Muhammad. Oh. Someone is telling us, yeah, we are adding those verses into the Quran because they were not at that at the first place, but Mr. this person, apparently the reason actually his testimony is correct because he testified to supportive of Muhammad. Muhammad was like doing some stealing and then he testified for Muhammad. Therefore, he got away with putting the verses into the Quran. 
There's a question uh, from Isaac. He says, there's a Muslim here who wants to know what are even one difference. Daughter of Christ, can you tell us the difference in Al-Fatiha between Malik and uh, Malik? Uh, yes, Malik means owner and Malik means king. They're completely d different words. They mean different things. There's difference between owner and king. Uh, what Muslims recite, the Hafs, most Muslims will recite Malik, which means owner. Um, and in um, the people who recite Malik, king, they, there is a, in the tafsir, um, uh, I think it's Al-Qurtubi who calls these people stupid because a king is more befitting, it's more better meaning than owner. Tabari is the same, so Tabari yeah. discredits the Hafs Quran. Yeah. We do have a short video on different versions of Surah Fatiha. Yeah. There are seven different versions of Surah Fatiha. Um, as well as there are, like, Muslims put together their own books to telling us what are those differences. Ten, Bridges translation of the ten crats can be good resources for these curious Muslims. And by the way, Malik and Malik are not the two, only two variations. There are more than ten variations uh, of this word, all, um, all, word meaning, yeah, right. all meaning different things. That's just within one verse. Yeah. I think Shadi Nasser will go through it um, Sister, as well. Yeah, yeah. We put, we also kind of edited that video and then put it up. Um, it's not only like honor and king, but it is also overall. We are looking at like there is Quran, which is different in five thousand places, Halat Quran, five thousand places from the Hafs Quran. Five thousand. What happened to dot by dot, letter by letter, sound by sound, word by word story? What happened? Oh, Allah is going to preserve it. What happened to the question which was asked, is this divine or not? If the, it is divine, why we are rejecting all different other versions? Why Tabari is not happy with Hafs Quran? Yeah, and he's saying one is more correct than the other. So if they're both divine, how can one be more correct? And he even calls it stupid. Don't you love Islam? It's just so beautiful, yeah. full of mess. Like it's worse than like Boxing Day dinner. You got you got human beings like uh, judging the Quran. You know which recitation, which Quran, which Quran. Not only judging, but also picking up and rejecting. Yeah, and removing by force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if you can say force, but that is just like life in prison. Or jail. Life in prison. Just chill there. Mm -hmm. You will be tortured a little bit. Just a little bit, and then you will die there. Your freedom is taken away from you. Oh. Uh, someone is saying in Arabic, owner equals king, <laughs> and not two camels. That, that... <gasps> no. So, um, the word owner and king in Arabic, in, used in Genesis chapter 14, I think, are in Arabic Bible, and they are used, like, written different. If they were exactly the same in Arabic, translators wouldn't make a distinction. If they were exactly the same way, you wouldn't get rid of Warsh Quran or Hafs Quran. Oh, which one should we pe pick? No. If they were exactly the same, today you wouldn't be like dealing with all those things. I can own a land, yeah. but I'm not king of that land. Very basics. Even with my broken English, I am very much aware of that. And people who say things in Arabic are different. No, it's just another language. We have a word for owner, just like English, and a word for king, just like English. We're Come not, on, sister. We're not, we're not some aliens that use, oh, owner, that means king. No, we have honor of, like sis, your sister said, land. I'm an owner of a house. We don't think an owner of a house is a king. No, we don't. Stop being stupid, please. If that was the case, then how did we communicate with each other for hundreds and hundreds of years as Arab people? We mean, we mean things the same way you do. Please stop being stupid. Why do you break my heart, sister? <laughs> I thought Arabic, Arabic is this untouchable language. Everything is just miracle in it. But you are just telling, no, it's like any other language. Yeah, you do have different words, different terms, like every other language. Yeah. Well, it, it was so untouchable that the prophet didn't even bother, false prophet didn't even bother yeah. to learn how to read it. Yeah, so untouchable, magical. Someone says, is the owner of bread king of bread? <laughs> Yeah. Well, that means everybody's king of bread because everybody got bread in the house. Yeah. Mm, let's right. continue. 
the only copy was with Abu Bakr, the first caliph, and then the sec the, when he died, um, the copy stayed with Umar, the second caliph, but when Umar dies, or when he died, the copy did not go to the third caliph, it went to his daughter, right? And that's also very intriguing because we are talking here about a governmental a constitution which should stay, let's say, in with the caliph. It goes from the first one, the second one, and it goes to the third one. But then when the second one died, it did not go to the third caliph. It went to his daughter. Of course, we don't have these sheets of Hafsa or the first codex. They are lost, um, or maybe they never existed. And also those five different copies that from the time of Uthman, also we don't have access to them. You know, they either never existed or also they were lost. So we have the main codex, which is from Kufa in Iraq. And the second codex is from Basra, also from Iraq. Okay, they are different. And you have a codex in Mecca, you have a codex in Medina, right? And you have a codex in Dimashq in Syria. So these are the five major codices. And uh, in Kufa, you have one codex, but there are three different readings on Kufa. And this is what makes seven in total. So three from Kufa, one from Syria, one from Mecca, one from Medina, and one from Basra, and these are seven. So basically God, spoke or you know recited the Quran to the pen which we don't know actually it's it's a pen let's think of a pen and then it's the tablet and the tablet Gabriel and Gabriel to the prophet also don't need to know Arabic to okay let's just understand this who oh, is gonna help me to understand why would why would Quran did not pass to the sec third caliph Uthman, but it was given to the uh, Hafsa, who is the wife of Muhammad, not even to Aisha. Mm -hmm. Why? And why they, they wanted to take Aisha's Quran, Hafsa's Quran and burn it, which they did after her death? Because it had differences. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't need to burn it. Um, because I stay with Sister Kay a lot, of, uh, I sing things now. <laughs> uh, yeah. And why, why, why was it hidden under her bed? She wouldn't give it up because she knew what, what, what they would do to it. They would destroy yeah. it and she treasured it. Yeah, like they, they took her Quran and then got rid of it. Yeah. Apparently, apparently, after her death. Because that was the only condition they, she gave the Quran. Um, okay. So, Quran travels to Kufa, Iraq. In one city, Kufa is like just a city in a country, you've got three different versions of that Quran. Hmm. What does it tell you about? Do not say three, but it's three different. <laughs> <laughs> but there is three, three different versions of it. In one city, don't you say like that's just magic? So I wonder what they recited in the mosques of that city. You had like maybe one mosque in the corner, do one, yeah. the other one. And it's different, yeah. yeah. And so let's look at the tra um, chains. Mm -hmm. So how did Muhammad receive the Quran? Did you pick that up? The pen? Allah the recited, the, yeah. recited the pen? Allah recited the pen. Mm. Pen passed it to the tablet. Mm -hmm. Tablet passed it to Jebrail. Yeah. Jebrail passed it to Muhammad. Yeah. Tablet says to Mr. Pan, Mr. Pan, pass me Surah 2 verse 130. Pan says, Mr. Pan says, of course, Mrs. Tablet, let me give it to you. A thing which cannot speak, which cannot, doesn't have a conscious in somehow, is capable to pass the Quran. And then Gabriel comes, and then Gabriel says to Mrs. Tablet, Mrs. Tablet, you've got the word of Allah. Muhammad is down there waiting for the word of Allah. Why? Because his wives are threatening him. We need, urgently need the verses. Hmm. Tablet says, of course, hold on a minute. Let me get it from the pan. There's a little bit going, coming. Where's forward. Allah? Allah passed it to pan and then moved on. <laughs> Allah didn't even bother to pass his word to Gabriel. See, like you need two bridges between Allah and the angel, so-called angel. Allah, pen, tablet, and Gabriel and Muhammad. Of course, there is no one who can check 
what has been passed from Allah to Gabriel because this Mrs. Pa Mr. Pan and Mrs. Tablet probably doesn't know that well Arabic to confirm what they learned. I just think it's just so funny. What is the it's not of the Quran? Let me give it to you. Pan, Tablet, Gabriel. They're all imaginary things you can't see, you know. Yeah, they don't even have conscious like Mr. Pan is not speaking. <laughs> He's yeah. not a living being. And somehow they messed up. Therefore, like Muhammad's Quran messed up, you can simply blame pen and tablet. No, they didn't want pen, so it was all about pen. Okay. Allah created pen, yes. Um, I guess my um, my next question would be, okay, for those that are saying, no, it was just one recitation and one Quran and um, why just even in that era, there are so many variances just in, in one, one city. city. Yeah, three different versions of the Quran in one city. Three different. Wow. That says a lot about itself. Oral tradition failed, written tradition failed, and even neighborhood is failed. If they were good neighbors with one another, they would just like, okay, let's pick one and then go with one. But they had three in one city. Allah need a pen because Allah can't read and write clearly. If he did, he wouldn't need a pen. He doesn't, sorry, he doesn't have a good memory. He needs to write things down. He forgets. Mm -hmm. He's forgetful. And remember, sister, all these cities, they were within one kingdom. Um, as in within one Islamic... Under one caliph, yeah. Yeah, under one Islamic ruling. So they could have just sent one codex to all those cities instead of seven. It was one, it, it became like multiplied. And for one city, they must have really confused the imams, giving them three. So it, it was sent as one, yeah. but when it reached there with the reciter, it gave birth to the many others. Give birth? And, yes, like from one, it became three. And then, of course, these three, remember? Asim has 50 students. And from this, they are going to pick only two. Because it kept like pro proliferating and giving birth to more and more. Yeah, this I... is like kind of Mr. Miswak. <laughs> it was like the formative years. He said before about the for formative years of the Quran, yeah. uh, like a child growing up. But it uh, looks like it was, it was quite an extended formative period for yes, the Quran. We are, we are in seventh century at this stage. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So soon after, like, Quran moves to the different cities, people are, like, already disagreeing with one another. Even before it moves, people are disagreeing with one another. Not good, not good, not good. Shall we continue? Yes, sister. Kufa was only one city, therefore you would expect there is only one dialect. Yeah. Kufa. These are the five major codices. And uh, in Kufa... You have one codex, but there are three different readings on Kufa, and this is what makes seven in total. So three from Kufa, one from Syria, one from Mecca, one from Medina, and one from Basra, and these are seven. So basically, God spoke or you know recited the Quran to the pen, which we don't know actually. It's it's a pen. Let's think of a pen, and then it's the tablet, and the tablet Gabriel and Gabriel to the Prophet. Also, don't need to know Arabic to see that there's a big difference between something like this and something like that. So this is the script today, fully voweled, you know, with, with uh, um, full diacritics. You read, and there's no problem in reading it. However, these are the early um, parchments or the early um, uh, manuscripts that we have of the Quran. And they are just consonantal script. They don't even follow the spelling uh, system that we have uh, today. And unless you are, you, you study this thing, you can read it. Otherwise, you cannot read it, even if you're an, an Arabist. Okay? If you are not initiated in the discipline, you won't really you know, know the differences. There are very big differences. For example, Maliki versus Maliki. So you have a short vowel and a long vowel, which makes a difference in the meaning. So one is king, one is owner. That's a very a textual difference between the two. Uh, um, beloved, do you want to kind of uh, express this once again? Because it just it, it came up in the chat as well. Those differences were actually nothing, but actually they were big difference. Oh. Word is big. Yeah, the Muslim that called me a liar. This is somebody else that I don't know saying the same thing. Shari Nasser. 
Malik and Malik, completely different uh, meanings. Uh, one has a longer uh, A vowel sound, um, that's owner, and Malik uh, has, is, doesn't have the long, long vowel, it means king. So, uh, any questions? Um, not any questions, but can you also comment on like this magical Arabic? Even the like Arabs are can't read it. So can you just yeah um, point that out how you, that magical Arabic becomes magical? Arab, Arabs. Arabs, modern Arabs, even like the, the few hundred years um, recent, you know, the recent ones. As an Arab, you cannot read um, Arabic, ancient Arabic text, because the Arabic that uh, we can read today has vowels, they, it has dots, it has diacritical marks. Um, the Arabic that was that the manuscripts are in uh, is a skeletal Arabic text. It has no markings on it. You can't read it. Um, I remember sister uh, uh, Dawa gang member who tried, even though he's not an Arab, to read um, a manus an Arab manuscript without any dots or anything. Um, you cannot read those texts unless you are an uh, Arabist. That means somebody who has studied the ancient Arabic text. But one of the things you can do in the intention to practice deception is yeah. you figure out which surah is it and you pretend that you are reading yet you are just reciting with the today's version. Mm. I can tell you, sister, I'm an Arab. I've never seen a fellow Arab try and read uh, an ancient Arab manuscript just from the skeleton. It is impossible. You need to be initiated in that kind of science or have some kind of background, background of, de of degree. Yeah. So it's not only Allah's kind of Arabic is failing, Allah's grammar is failing, Allah's language development is failing. Yeah. It, this early childhood seems like not doing well at all, brother. <laughs> yes, it seems like, um, like the Quran is Allah's problem child. Very naughty. Not good, not good. Um, Shall we continue? There's another which is Maliki. Okay, there's another form also of a king, which is very different also from the script. There's one which Malikun Liyomi. There's an additional particle here, which is also different from the script. Even the, the information we have from the classical sources, actually, they don't tell us how the prophet recited. We don't have any information whatsoever how the prophet was reading. There are more textual. We do not know how did Prophet reciting, how was Prophet reading? We didn't know, we don't know, we will never know. So we don't have a Quran collected at the time of Muhammad and we don't know how he recited. Yeah. So how come we have something called Islam today? Good question, sister. <laughs> we need to go back to Ibn Mujahid to get answer to that uh, question, that or Al-Azhar yeah. to get answer to that very basic question. Variations which are more problematic, okay? Sometimes they would change the meaning, sometimes they wouldn't. Again, the question for us as a theologian, you want to think, okay, this is the word of God, this is, this, this is the speech, this is how it was transmitted to the Prophet. Did God one day say, min tahtiha and another day tahtaha, or was there one way and then somehow the way the text was transmitted, it had problems in it and we don't know exactly which one was. And then our job and what Muslim scholars were trying to do in the past, you know, 1200 years, try to figure out was there one reading more um, solid or more justified grammatically, you know, textually than the other reading or both are equal. Grammarians, they were very uneasy with that. Like, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Of course it matters to me. It's a particle. You are talking about a whole particle missing from the text. I can't just like, you know, get rid of that particle and say, well, I, I will ignore it. And this is why you have uh, this um, division between grammarians, Arabic grammarians and theologians. Grammarians would challenge the system of the seven readings. They would tell you, this reader, he didn't know enough Arabic. This reader doesn't know Arabic grammar very well. Uh, I don't accept the reading of Hamza Zayyad or Al-Kisai because uh, they didn't really study grammar with Sibawai, or the great grammarian, right? And this is why if you go back to the theologians, they would respond to the grammarians. Oh, you infidels. Um, where is that? This word here, for example, again, you don't need to know Arabic. You see a, a circle right here. Okay, and this word it's it's la uh, ta'manna. Okay, and if you it's in Arabic grammar again, there is a problem here because 
according to Arabic grammar, it should be there's an additional noon which is missing, an additional n. So there should be another tooth there. You know, so you see there's a there's a little nudge here, tooth. According to the rules of Arabic grammar, there should be additional one. There should be another one here, but it's not. Okay, so the word should be ta'manuna tu nuna. However, it is written in the text with one n. So reciters were also uneasy with that. So what do we do with that missing end? So what they did is they put a circle right here. Okay, okay. And there are many of these. This is in Arabic we call ishmam. That's uh, one of the rules of recitation, which means uh, you give the scent of one letter to another letter or of one vowel to another vowel. And you don't want to say malaka la ta'mannuna because the u it doesn't exist in the text. The text is sacred, right? So you play around, you do a trick and you are not touching the script. Okay, but you are telling the audience, you are telling the person uh, who is listening to you, wait, this is, this is, uh, Arabic grammar is there, I'm not like really getting rid of Arabic grammar, so look at my lips, I know that there is a U there, but it's not in the script. You do trick. It should be there, but it is not there. What we've got to do, we've got to do trick to save the Quran. Letta is missing. Grammar, grammarian says, oh, oh, Quran messed up with the grammars. Theologian says, theology is messed up. What we are going to do? Allah knows best, knows nothing. Can't even step to fix it all. Do you want to make a comment on the, how they trick um, Muslims on the, this perfect, um, on this perfect Quran system? Yeah, so the uh, example he said was in Surah 12, verse 11, Surah Yusuf, uh, verse 11. So um, it should say, right? Uh, you should have a two N sounds. But the text says only has one N. So what do we do, sister? Trick. So the correct gra grammar is two Ns, the, um, but the text says one N. So you want to be faithful to the text. So what they used to do is be faithful to the text saying one N, but with their mouth, without moving it, without producing any sound, moving it as if it were two Ns. You do a trick um, so that you, they, they both are happy, so that the theologians are happy and the grammarians are happy and you're still faithful to the incorrect text. So Allah needs help. So you just deceive. <laughs> yeah. You just deceive. So, so is that uh, is that like compromising? Yeah. No, you are trying to save Allah. Like Allah failed. Like oh. they don't like they don't know why Allah forget to put N there, or when people were putting the Quran together, where is this N? It doesn't make sense to the grammarians. Feel it doesn't make theological sense. What we've got to do? Allah is looking bad right now. It's not because he's got only like open shin, but. He is looking very bad. We've got to save him. You know, I've been told continuous, continually throughout this uh, time with the kitchen crew that I need to learn how to compromise better. And I'm finally getting it now. That Allah, even <laughs> thank Allah... Thank you to Islam that you are learning to compromise. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Allah, I understand your struggles. I understand your pain. Yes, let's all compromise. Yeah. And not only that, sister, they, the people who wrote the text, they put a little marking on the incorrect word so, yeah. just to give the reader a, a hint. Remember, this is the time you do the trick <laughs> to cover up for the mistake. Sad, isn't it? It's supposed, to, it's supposed to break our heart that they are trying to rescue Allah and Muhammad by simply deceiving and making tricks. And then they would say, oh, this is how you recite it. And then they would label this as it makes it beautiful. Oh, poof, not good at all. Theologians disagree. Grammars disagree. What do they do? They find the compromising skills and then let's deceive. It will all be nice one day. Well, Allah is a deceiver, so his followers also deceive each other and play tricks on each other to He's save the best him. of deceivers. Well, obviously not the best because I think this trick is quite... It's, it's better Clever. than anything Allah has ever done. Yeah. Allah couldn't write words. Sorry? Allah couldn't write words correctly, so he, apparently he needs help from his deceptive powers. Mr. Pan and Mrs. Tablet didn't 
Maybe they didn't do a good job. We can't blame Allah. Yeah. He's the source. Okay, what if the pen was mad at the tablet and didn't give it everything it needed? Yeah, so we need to find whom to blame. Mm -hmm. And then we could ask Ibn Mujahid to put that being pen or the tablet in prison. Yeah, on trial. We got a question, sister. Where can we find the original Hafs Quran? Oh, Allah knows best. I don't know. We don't have the original Hafs Quran. <laughs> Today, we do not have the original Hafs Quran. Apparently, we do have a couple of different Hafs Qurans, but um, Hafs Quran is supposed to be 796, late 8th centuries, and we do not have at this stage, you never know, Allah knows nothing knows best, tomorrow there might be um, Hafs Quran people, historically they might find it, but at this stage we don't have it. Earliest Hafs Quran, depend which one you are looking at, can be found in 1923 in um, Egypt, or in 1980s, which has been officialized again, um, but which one is the original Hafs? That's another another um, question. Original, original, original Hafs, 7th century one, we don't have it. Did you notice, sister, how Shari Nasser said, for the past 1,200 years, scholars have been trying to work this out? Not 1,400 years, 1,200 years. Yeah. What does it say to you? 200, it took 200 years for Islam to take its baby steps and then give birth to Islam. And after that, the birth wasn't even complete. Um, in those 1,200 years, the Muslim scholars were trying to work out which reading is more justified. No. And some readers didn't know Arabic, didn't know grammar. <laughs> uh, but what does their knowledge matter? They're just reciting what should already be known to everyone. Yeah, they, they already learn. All they needed to pass it around. Yeah. Without their lying fingers, it needed the only mouth is supposed to be moving. And just one letter is missing. Someone is asking, sister, if you give empty blank musaf to Yasir Kadi, will he write it with N or mm. without N? How many N's will he put? That's a good question, Sistan. I think you already answered it. It's not an easy yes or no. <laughs> it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, I'm, I believe he said the emperor with no clothes is the situation. It's like he liked him, likened it to. Mm. Anyway, that was kind of end of our video. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we will get, we will see what uh, chat is saying. But before we look at the chat, um, kitchen crew. Can you help me to understand what you understood so far? I understand that Allah knows absolutely nothing. <laughs> or Allah failed to keep his promises to protect the Quran. He's a failure. Yes, to per perfectly preserve his word. Um, he just has like, uh, we call it in, I guess, in different musical arenas, they call it a remix where they come up with something new every other time and it's like a variation but somehow for them it's still one song perfectly preserved which is not it, or one word perfectly preserved and honestly um, just the, on the premise alone that you've been told that it's been perfectly preserved and it's one Quran and you're finding these variances you need to come to Jesus Christ because he is the truth he is the living word okay. Amen I learned that uh, compromising skills are very important when working with others. Um, and then also com compromising skills are very important when working with a perfectly preserved Quran of Allah. Is this there? It's just a mess. <laughs> That's all I can say, sister. Even the compromise skills won't work. Uh, here because think... it's just so much messed up. <laughs> <laughs> like how much are you going to compromise? God of Christ, yes. compromise skills, please. Um, honestly, I, I, and I'm taking it from this question, if I was Allah, I wouldn't have chosen Arabic um, to uh, give the last word because, as someone said, surface four, the Arabic writing wasn't fully developed yet. So yeah. it was a bit stupid. Sorry, I keep saying this word stupid. Um, it was a bit stupid from Allah, who's meant to know everything, to reveal his last words to an illiterate prophet who couldn't read and write, he couldn't collect the text, he couldn't um, dictate it to a scribe. 
and then write it in a language that no one can read until they fully develop it hundreds of years later. Yeah, ninth century still Arabic is developing. Yeah. So it's been like not not fully formed at all. Um, and also remember the questions theologians are asking when it comes to the, with the co um, on the compromise skills of grammarians. Yeah. Did Allah said something and then tomorrow he changed his mind? Mm -hmm. What was happening? Why suddenly we do end up having these different versions of it? And did you notice sister Muslims calling each other infidels? While they were debating these things? Or putting them in prison? So much love. They even loved one another, let alone they even love, um, love the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, someone is pointing out the um, miracle number 19 of the Quran. I think the um, basic question is which Quran you are talking about? Muhammad's Quran? Mm -hmm. Uthman's Quran? Hafsa's Quran? Hafs Quran? Whatever Quran, which century Quran it is. But let's go with today's Quran, Hafs. Half Quran, miracle of number 19 points us to Lord Jesus Christ. Surah 19, verse 19, sinless child is being born. Surah 19, verse 19 is the miracle number 19. Um, anything needs our attention in the chat, beloveds? We got somebody called Weeby. He says, I, as a Muslim, believe Christianity and Buddhism are peaceful religions, but Islam is just honestly not peaceful. Then why are you Muslim? Yeah, I don't think that makes you Muslim anymore. And is Buddhism peaceful? But the other thing is like you don't put your eternity on some something because something is peaceful. You put your eternity in something because it is true. Yes. And you can't find the truth in all these different Qurans. They don't even know. Yep. Um, yes, um, there are different half scrums, seven of them. And there are differences in these half scrums. Um, we did make a video, a couple of videos we've got as speakers going to be the examples. Please do check that out for the examples. Even half scrums are not dot by dot, letter by letter, sound by sound, word by word, exactly the same. Even the half scrum messed up. Um, anything else? Uh, could you explain why a book with 20% errors isn't perfect? Because there are errors. <laughs> <laughs> um, you wouldn't trust your surgeon if he says, I will operate on you, but I have a 20% error rate. Yeah, I, I will operate you. I will put, the, I will leave the... Uh, scissors inside it I might instead yeah. of taking your kidney I might take off your heart it's only 20 percent yeah only 20 percent of my patients die that's fine yeah I <laughs> might, you might be one of them <laughs> um claim is mus claim comes from Muslim missionaries 21st century dot by dot letter by letter sound by sound word by word it's exactly the same Quran perfectly preserved and their perfectly preserved and understanding is dot to the letter to the word to the sound so not 20 percent even if one letter is moving even if the one sound is different that just um, shows how allah messed up in the preservation of the quran because allah says he is going to protect it so perfectly preserved quran actually perfectly put holes in itself and man called Muhammad didn't even do his job. Daughter of Christ said that he had one and only job to pass the last message of Allah to humanity. Not to pass certain things from him to women or children, but, <laughs> but pass the message of Allah to humanity. He failed to do that. Man called Uthman, who had nothing to do with Allah, who never spoke to Allah, who never had a conversation with pen, tablet, or Gabriel, decides to get burn the Qurans and put his one, collect his one Quran. Ibn Mujahid, no records of him having to chat with Gabriel. There is no record that Gabriel is squeezing him. 
there is no record that Allah is talking to him and helping him out, but decides he's gonna go with a certain amount of the Quran outside of out of fifty. Nineteen twenty-four, Al Azhar. We don't get to read that they simply had a revelation from Allah. Allah picked up the Quran. Very much man-made book. So even one word that we don't need to twenty percent. We don't even need 30, 20, 37 different Arabic Qurans. Just one extra Quran with one word destroys Islam. And it already destroyed Islam. Comments? Anything else needs our attention? Uh, I think Muslims ought to uh, learn the history of the Quran. How it came about, how it was collected, and how it reached their hands. And when they do that, sister, they will leave Islam. Uh, Yasser Qadi was, he started that process, but he didn't come from nothing. He came from Yale and from Medina University. He knows the deal. And this gentleman, Shad, uh, Shadi Nasser, is from Harvard. Harvard. So you got Harvard and Yale, yeah? And uh, we've got this illiterate prophet who couldn't transmit the Quran to his um, companions in, you know, accurately enough and cause all these problems on the way. Uh, I'd say that means that Allah did not fulfill his promise in Surah 15, 15 9. verse 9. He said he will preserve it, and it's his word, and it hasn't. So that makes him a false god, and it makes his um, prophet a false prophet. Yep. Simple as that. And the reason it is important, the reason it is important because it affects your eternity. Only the perfect Quran is going, to, only the right recitation is going to intercede for you on the Day of Judgment. You've got many different, only one of them is going to intercede for you. Just messing up or getting the wrong one can affect your eternity seriously. Those are serious, serious, serious things. Anyone is ready to laugh? So yes. here it is on the screen. Let's laugh together. You wish to find errors in the Quran, but you failed miserably. Islam is spreading so fast that you people are scared. Mm -hmm. The Islam will reach to your homes. <laughs> Sister, I know you have a rule against being personal. We don't do personal. Okay. Um, then I won't say anything. <laughs> we can make a comment Comment on the comment. Uh, find errors in the Quran. We want, fi we want, fi we want to find the Quran among the errors. Ooh. We don't. It's, it's the Quran that we want to find among the errors, not the errors to find the, the errors in the Quran. The fact that there's variations you don't have one Quran. That's one. So there's your narrative. That's dead. Then, then you say it's perfectly preserved. You have multiple errors. It's not. We're not afraid of anything, dear. That that's not at all. You're living in deception, and we're trying to bring you into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ, into the glorious gospel. So Quran is gonna reach to your homes. Is, sorry, um, Islam is going to reach to your homes. Yeah. Oh, well, I need, I need to figure out, but I believe I, I'm strongly right now in need of CCTV and then double chains. <laughs> and when the Islam comes, that I'll make sure my doors are chained up. Oh, no. Security is important because when Islam comes, it doesn't come with baklava or falafel. How does it come? The sword. Yep. So you want to chain everything. You want to chain everything so Islam doesn't enter. And the houses Islam entered, we heard from a scholar, simply people who disagree end up in prison. Islam entered in the house of Muhammad, poor wives of Muhammad. Humanity become already in danger. Islam is, I don't want to, like, I'm, I don't do personal things, but like crushing your heart, 
don't want to do it, but Islam is not spreading at all. Islam is dying, even according to your Muslim missionaries and your Muslim scholars. Islam is dying so fast, you are not even going to notice that because you can't even defend your Allah or fix the holes in the Quran with zero skills. Yes. It says Islam will reach our homes. I just lock the door. Islam was in my home. I'm just trying to leave it and it won't let me go. <laughs> I'm trying to stop Islam killing me. My house is invite only. Don't you come to my door. <laughs> people are trying to leave Islam and being stopped. Uh, and you're trying to bribe people into Islam and invite them in and make them celebrities. Yeah, Islam comes to Islam comes to your home to take your life or Islam comes to your home to help you to have set up new YouTube channel. People are, people are trying to leave Islam. People are... <laughs> <laughs> okay, focus. <laughs> Sorry, sister. You, go on. you guys okay? <laughs> I'm good. You're having too much fun. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, pe people are uh, dying trying to leave Islamic countries, swimming in the oceans to go to un-Islamic countries. Uh, Islam is chasing them. <laughs> people are trying to run away from your Islam. <laughs> Was that a preview? Sorry, sorry. Preview? Wait, are you okay, for a yeah, sorry. You see, guys, that's what I've been living with for the past few days. Like these two sisters messing about, messing about, having laughing and giggling like little schoolgirls, and we can't get anything done. Yes, daughter of Christ and I have been very professional, and these, <laughs> these two sisters. Thank you for giving us a good laugh, uh, as if, we, uh, as if uh, I retract the personal um, statement that I was going to Yes, thank you so much. For giving our sister a tune. <clears throat> yes, the focus. Uh, focus. Let's focus laugh. this then. Focus. So, Islam is. <laughs> don't make focus. don't make don't make me practice Surah Four Thirty Four on you ladies. <laughs> Your sisters need to repent. Focus. I'm focused. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh dear. Uh -oh. You gotta run. Okay, we need to. People are telling you to pull yourself together, sister. Yes. Focus. Focus. Focus, sister. Focus. Well, Focus. Counting. It's, it. uh... it's just the errors in the Quran. It's just so funny. Yeah. Oh, this one. Got this. Think. Think of something sad. <laughs> think of something sad. Okay, you got it. Counting. We got this. <laughs> Uh, guys, this is a preview of um, things things to come from uh, DCCI Ministries. Yes, you can look forward to something very special. Yeah, very funny. Very soon. <clears throat> Focus. Sister, can you take a break for a second? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, is there any other comments we need to... Um, need our attention? Um... Just people telling you to focus. Okay, just focus on the like other comments, like which we just focus help us to focus. Focus, yeah, yeah, focus. <laughs> yeah, God bless, uh, yeah, yeah. May you come to Christ. Um, yeah. So, so um, you wish to find errors in the Quran, but you failed miserably. Islam is spreading so fast that you people are scared. The Islam will reach your homes. Anyone wants to make last comment on this? I'm not scared of Islam, sister, except the, the part that where it wants to kill me. But as an ideology or religion, I think it's laughable. And I think we proved that just now. Yeah. Yeah. So, practical tips when Islam comes to your home. Um, get a panic alarm. Make sure you put, put the chains behind the doors because when it comes, it is not going to come with the flowers and roses. It is not going to come with baklava. So, and those of you who are running away from Islam, where Islam reached your homes, that you are running away from Islam, 
as you get out to home, as you get out your home to run away from Islam, run to the home and place Lord Jesus Christ offered you. Run to the arms of Lord Jesus Christ who offers you home and who offers you place in the bosom of the Father. Because if you don't know where you are running from Islam, you will pretty much messed up. With Islam or without Islam not believing in triune God, it is almost the same place. Not almost actually, it is the same place. We want you to run when Islam comes to your home, to the arms of Lord Jesus Christ, because there is no any other way. There is no any other one. There is no one who can protect you. There is no one who can concern for you. There is no one who can rescue you beside Lord Jesus Christ. Um, do we have any last comment? Otherwise, we will kind of finish with the kind of our song. No, sister. Okay. Continue. So, um, sister, come and focus now. We, we just messed up. We need to focus now. So, what we will do is... Um, we will put together the song and then all kitchen crew kind of sings this song together and this is like finally they are leaving very soon this is our like beginning of the party so while they are here they will take a part in the party by singing the song please join us in the chat if you think shut the doors shut the windows you don't want to kill the birds with your singing skills <laughs> Um, and join us, um, join us with the song. I'm, I'm verbalizing it once again, sister. We need to focus. We already messed up very much. Um, mm -hmm. But that messed up, I, I think, was it scheduled for tomorrow? What is? Oh, yes. Yeah, tomorrow you will, you will guess why we messed up. Um, so let's, let's go and um, sing our song. We will see you. After this song, we will hang up. We will see you at Speaker's Corner, by God's grace, or at the bosom of the Father. Um, if you can't make it at Speaker's Corner, or if, if it is not time for the bosom of the Father, we will see you on another live stream. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you uh, to Muslim scholars whose job to put more, more holes in the Quran. So we really appreciate their work. And we want to use their work to destroy ideology of Islam. Come on. Everyone. Yeah. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the King of Kings who died to save us all. If you just repent and believe he took your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false God, a false God, a false God. Allah is a false God, a false, false God. Is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad is not a prophet. Muhammad is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the light. Jesus is the King of Kings who died to save us all. If you 
repent, just repent, and believe you take your sins on the cross. And mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But and there is a false god, a false god, a false god, and there is a false god, a false, god, a false god. Is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. And Muhammad, what? Is not a prophet. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the King of Kings who died to save us all. If you what? just repent <laughs> and believe and take your sins on the cross, then mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours. But Allah is a false god, a false god, a false god. Allah is a false god, a false, false god. If you want grace and mercy and love, Islam is not for you. But Jesus is the way, the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the King of Kings who died to save us all. If you just repent. And believe he took your sins on the cross. As he did. Then yes. mercy and grace, forgiveness and love, eternity can be yours.